Warm welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael schmidt Enres uh, from the BCRT, and it's uh, my immense pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Chantal Pichon from the University of Orléans in France. Uh, Chantal is a full professor at the Faculty of Sciences and Technique, University of Orléans, and also the head of Cell Biology, Pharmaceutical Targets, Innovative Therapy Department. Uh, Chantal holds a PhD in, in microbiology and cell biology um, at the University of Marseille in France and a habilitation diploma in molecular and cell biology at the University of Orléans. She also holds plenty honorary administrative positions and duties as well as uh, a national and international mandates. But most importantly, Chantal is a newly appointed prestigious BIH visiting professor at the, uh, at the Stiftung Charité of the BIH. Uh, where Dieter Volk and I are the hosts, and which realized that with the project of developing improved targeted cell and gene therapy by advanced ex vivo and in vivo RNA technologies. Um, Chantal is a translational researcher, as well as uh, uh, the main research activity lie in the interface of biology and chemistry and are dedicated mainly to the use of nucleic acids as uh, therapeutics. Um, Chantal pioneered mRNA based cancer vaccine formulated as liboplexus uh, by intravenous injection and her uh, efforts currently are now focused on the delivery of long mRNA and mRNA bioproduction, uh, two of main issues still to be solved with wider mRNA applications. So we very much now look forward to hearing your talk, Chantal, and stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to give this lecture today. Uh, first of all, I would like to give a sincere thank to uh, Stiftung Charity for allowing me to have this invited professorship and giving us the opportunity to start a project with the BAH Regeneration Center and as well as the PCAT uh, in Berlin. So, um, today, um, I am going to really give you uh, a kind of overview on what we know to uh, actually in this uh, new technology, it's not so new, but the mRNA technologies is really very promising. So my talk will be divided in five parts, like the introductions on mRNA structure, productions and delivery system. And then I will give uh, actually um, the, 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 some issues like the biodistribution, translation and modifications of nucleoside, but also targeting issues, which is really one of a bottleneck. I will give some example, and uh, in the end, I will also sh give you a kind of summary of what actually we plan to do together with the, for the colleagues uh, uh, for, um, uh, at BSCRT and BCAT. And I really would like to, before starting my talk, really, uh, say that I'm very grateful to Professor Dieter Volk and also uh, Professor Mi Mi Michael schmucke Henares. It's it's really for me. Uh, I mean, a, a very I'm very honored actually to work with both of you. Okay, so this is actually you know, my first slide. is a kind of busy slide, but I think it's very important to show it because it shows that the mRNA technology advances are actually it has been filled with really a several disciplines from the discovery to the clinic. And if you see, this is actually a kind of color, color coded. You have fundamental research on mRNA, molecular biology, but also on the immunology. And then we have the delivery systems, which is in blue, and then we have the application. So you can see that as, as soon as early as 1960, there are already, already a kind of crosstalk between these two disciplines. And you see that in 1993, the first application on how we are on what, uh, using mRNA uh, to inject as a protein replacement, but also for immune influenza immunization has been started. And actually it was in the Institute Pasteur here. Of course, there are key milestones the first one is how to produce it. The second one is, and it's very, very important, it's Catalin Carico and Drew Weissman in 2005. Actually, they really find out that, found out that if you have a 
uh, non uh, produce in vitro produced mRNA, you can induce immune system. And of course, I just want to uh, we there are uh, I just want, I really want to also to grant biotech company because without them, I think we, we would not be here today. So CureVac, BioNTech and Moderna, I'm just uh, I want to say that uh, Germany has made a, such a, a lot of uh, actually important uh, uh, funding, important funding and also a lot of knowledge on the field. Um, you can see that here. Uh, amazingly, uh, you have in parallel the development of lipid nanosystem, uh, liposomes by Bangam in 1961, liposomes with mRNA as soon as 1990. And you see the LNP, the very system that we are using for the vaccine against COVID-19, started to be used for chemotherapeutics and was started to be used for mRNA in 2009. And here is the key milestone. ISIRNA against transtyretine for amyloidosis. It was formulated with LNP, approved in 2018. And I think this is really a very important uh, point. So the benefit of mRNA is just because we have a translation machinery in the cytosol, no need for nuclear import, no genes of bacteria from bacteria, so unable to integrate in the genome. There is an institute production of a protein, so we have all of the post post translational modification, and there is an in-situ production of antigens, so we will have all the epitopes. And I think you can use it as a uh, specific kind of personalized drug, but you can also use it as a generalized drug. So this is really very important, and here you can see here different types of application. I'm going to very fast here because I think most of you know the mRNA structure. Today, we know exactly what we have to put at the five prime, at the five three prime, but also at the five prime untranslated and three prime untranslated regions. We know exactly what is our type of sequences, and there are more and more, more and more and more work on that to allow to get a very high expressions of the proteins. Um, but you know, if you actually made a uh, uh, optimizations of your mRNA. You, for one type of application, it's very easy for you to modify the URF and then to put another type of genes. That's why you have this flexibility. To optimize the mRNA translation, I think we really need have to, 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 to the Catalin Caricos and Weissmann's uh, uh, discovery uh, was very important because, you know, uh, modification is actually part of the maturation process of different types of, mRNA, of RNA. There are more than 100 modification and they have, have a very good influence, high influence, sorry, on mRNA fate and expression. She found out that if you put in, in front of different types of immune cells, mRNA that are not modified, you have actually inflammatory cytokine which is secreted. And if you modified the nucleoside of those mRNA, you reduce highly those inflammatory cytokines. And as a consequence, you will have an increase, of course, of the mRNA translation, as you can see here for the luciferous mRNA. But you can see here also that it's not, it, it's dependent on the type of modification. So clearly, we really know how to optimize different types of the structure, as I said, for the mRNA. So here, why it's like that? It's just because, you know, we have a different types of immune system, high net immune sensors, but in the end, allow and uh, induce inflammations, and it's also phosphorylation of this PKR. Reagent. So in my lab, actually, we pro I, I propose to this new strategy. It has been founded by uh, a European project to bioproduce the mRNA inside yeast, which is an eukaryotic cells. We accumulate the, the, the mRNA, and the idea is actually you can extract it easily. Very interesting because we will have a naturally modified mRNA. 
So people are involved in this, is actually tackling this challenge. They are there from a different part of Europe. The, the, if you are using a drug, you need actually to think about the extracellular barrier and the intracellular barrier. So here uh, you need to think about how to protect, to enhance the uptake of this mRNA, but you also need to figure out once it's inside the cells, how it can escape from the endosomes when it's actually confined. And I think something that I'm, I don't have time to, to discuss today because of time, but the intracellular routing, the release locations and impact on cell signaling is very important. So we are just mimicking, you know, the, the virus infection. There are a lot of them. So we, virus, they are actually making strategy to fuse with the endosomes to destabilize and to permeabilize. There are different types of uh, delivery systems that you can find out today. I will just discuss today with like, lipid-based one, lipid nanoparticles, of course, lipoplexes, lipo liposomes, and also hybrid lipid polymer that we are doing in my lab. So an example of strategy to escape from the cytosol is actually the case of imidazole-based polymer and lipid, what we have proposed as early as 1999. A lot of people are actually using this strategy today. So you see here, we have this imidazole group, which is, can be protonated at pH 6. So it's a weak base. And once it's protonated, you actually, in, in, in a milieu, you know, which is acidic, like the endosomes, you will have what is called the proton sponge accumulations of water and ions releasing the nanoparticles inside the cytosol. But if you have a liposome, you can also induce what is the fusion. So we made the different types of them, lipids, but also polymer. So I'm going to talk to this one. It refers to, you know, I make a, a, a electrostatic interaction between the polymer on the mRNA and encapsulations of the particle. And you see here that you can really uh, make a big particles, 99, around 100 nanometer. In this gel shift assay, you see that it's, it cannot enter the gel, and you can actually treat with RNAs, it's protected by contrast to the mRNA, which is free. They have a uh, kind of physiogenic assay, as you can see here. pH 7, of course, is lower low than the DOP, which is very high, have a very high physiogenicity, but HP exists, it's higher than the 2P. And if you treat the cells with bifidomycin, which is blocking the pH, acid, acidic pH, you see that you're disrupting actually the, the exp expressions of the nucleic acid that you are uh, delivering. So the liposomes and the lipid nanoparticles is really the gold, gold standard today. So how we are actually making this? You need to have a lipos uh, lipids which can be cationic or ionizable. So this is, actually, this is actually the part of these lipids. You have a head group, as I said. The ionizable one is actually pH dependent. There are different types of them. You need to have a linker. And this linker, it's very important. It can be non-biodegradable or biodegradable. We know today that if it's biodegradable, you can have a rapid clearance in vivo, but you can know, uh, we can reduce the, the cytotoxicity. And the tail impacted the PKA, lipophilicity, fluidity, and physiogenicity. And it can be saturated or unsaturated. So you can have to handle on all of these different types of group to really make your uh, system. But you need also helper lipids. You need phospholipids. Phospholipid, like DSPC, something which is strong to, take, to, to have a stability, rigidity, but something like DOP, which actually have a possibility to destabilize the endosomal membrane because of the shape of the, of, the, of the lipids. And we need also something that is like cholesterol, which can actually reduce the sequestrations of the cholesterol from the outside of the blood, from the blood, which could disrupt actually the particles. And you have need to have also the peg lipid here to prevent the aggregation. So this exactly, the compounds, compositions of the community, but also the spike backs from Moderna. And in my lab, we are also doing this. So the production is easy. You can do it, you know, uh, by hand. Uh, Tonalic inje injection for the liposomes or thin layer film hydrations. But you can also do it by microfluidics. This is what I'm doing in my lab. So you can make the liposomes first. 
And then you add your mRNA and you have an EC electrostatic interaction. Or you can actually make the LNP where the liposomes and the mRNA is put in the machine. And then you have this, you know, this encapsulation. So once you have this, you need to really figure out how many is entrapped, the size and, the, uh, and then uh, identify, uh, uh, characterize actually what you have in hands. So there are different types of equipment that you, uh, methods that you can use. This is an example of what we are doing in my lab. So you can see you have a very, by using a microfluidic, you have a stable, homogeneous, and very low quality dis dispersity. But if you would like to have something which is working, you have to have a precise mixing of the specific component that you are going to put in your formulation. Here, it's just an example, but to, for the NK cell translation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, uh, um, in a few slides uh, um, um, ahead. So you can see the cationic, the, the amount of cationic, lipos, uh, cationic liquid does matter. So you see here, it's higher. 80% higher uh, M5 because it is a GFP. And you can also actually have an influence of the type of uh, component that you are adding. Again, here you can see that you have a very good um, uh, difference in terms of uh, expressions of the GFP depending on the type of component that you are using. The storage and stability is really problematic today, but we and different people are working on it and we have to do it for different types of formulations, of course. We can actually, you know, modify in the, the buffer, but you can also, the idea is to put it in a free, freezing method, but also making it as a lyophilized because I love, it's, allowed, it's, it's very easy for the handling and for, you know, uh, to ship. Uh, I'm going to show you to, the, 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 problem, the problems of biodistribution translation and modification of nucleic, nucleoside. This is a paper from Katie Whitehead, Whitehead Lab. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the, this, it, she used uh, her own, of course, uh, 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 lipids. Uh, and she tried to use either unmodified or modified nucleoside. I just want to show you that the biodistribution after an, an, an intravenous injection with non-modified mRNA, you see that depending on the type of cationic lipids, it looks like a little bit different, but majorly it's in the liver, okay, the LNP they made. But when they look, you look at the expression of the mRNA, again, it can be very different depending on the type of cationic lipid they are using. For this one, it's going to mostly in the lung and this one mostly in the liver. And what is very interesting is that with their formulation by using modified nucleoside, they actually, she can actually modify the targeting, the expression, I mean, the expressions of the mRNA. You see with M1 pseudouridine, it is higher in the spleen and lower in another one. And for these two types of actually of uh, cationic lipid. So it shows you that in this specific formulation, just by modifying the mRNA type, and also, of course, the type of cationic liquid, you can actually switch the expression. And in my lab, it's not like that, because I can actually use modified or non-modified nucleoside. I still have something which is going to the liver. So clearly, we need to work out exactly what you have to put inside these nanoparticles. Now, I would like to, to talk about the targeting issues. This is actually, we call it in France, the nerf de la guerre, because it's very, very difficult and it's the most challenging part. There are different possibilities. You can use what is called the passive targeting. You have to fine tune the component. And I'm going to show you an example from BioNTech. And you can use active targeting, adding moieties, ligand moieties, or antibodies, or peptide. And here I'm just going to show you what we, are, we have done on using actually manos motif for manos receptor and dendritic cells. But you can also do what is called endogenous targeting. Here it's the corona protein that are actually on the nanoparticles that will drive the targeting of the nanoparticles. It's a little bit complicated. I don't know if it's really very, um, uh, I think it's quite difficult. 
So the selective targeting to the spleen by fine tuning the component, very interesting made by Ugor Sain. The, they actually use a very simple phospholipid, uh, DOTAP and DOP. And they just, you know, make a different types of ratio between these different uh, lipids, many more, more, more than that. And they are just, you know, choose something which is stable in terms of formulation, something which is negatively charged. And here, this actually formulation has very high, quite high, quite high uh, size, but homogeneous, I would say. Uh, and uh, Having can it be expressed, you know, uh, during eight day and stable at four degrees. So you see here by fine tuning, they actually modifying the targeting of the expressions of the luciferase, but they injected intravenously. Five to one lungs here, one seven, one point seven two, it's going to the spleen, as you can see here. So this is really, a, really a, like I would say, a very fine uh, um, search of the different ratio. And of course, they use it, a, a, um, a valbumin model, P16 uh, expression of albumin antigen as a model. And you can see here the survival value is really high, quite high. Uh, and it's the same for GP7 T for melanoma. You can see here it's really very high as well in terms of, exp uh, of, uh, of survival. And of course, in this model of metastasis, by injecting by IV B16 F10 luciferase, I think it's the, 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 the image is really quite clear. Using a TRP1 as antigen, you see that we really clear actually the metastasis. So today uh, they are actually using for clinical trial. So different types of antigens. So the beauty is that you can actually use different types of antigen, mRNA coding for different antigen. Here it's for TAA, antigen associated tumor. They are 42, 42 patients with metastasis, stage four, which is very high, difficult. And they combine it anti PD-1 antibody. And some of them are actually have been treated with antibody, uh, PD-1 antibody and chemotherapy, but it didn't work. But this is actually one of the example. You see, of course, there is non-responder, but there is a very good responder after the vaccination. And you can see here, oh, I'm sorry for this, you see here, after, before, the, before the treatment, after the vaccination, you can see it's really reducing, you know, actually the nodules in the lung. So durable single antitumoral activity, adding the anti-BTI is really beneficial. And today they are in a phase two, two for this lipomeric trial. The second example is actually the tissue targeting specific by, you know, they call it sorting, sorting. So what they did, they just add a, a fifth component, fifth lipid in, in the LNP component I told you. One, uh, a dotap, which is a, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, 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 anionic, so you can see it it's, uh, uh, it's goes with dotap lipid, sorry, it goes to the liver. If they add a, uh, a P, this uh, P, PA, 18 PA, it's going to the spleen, but if they add a cationic dotap, it's going to the lung. So you can see here exactly how is the distributions of those uh, different types uh, of uh, formulations after uh, I, IV injection, actually, and um, biodistribution with Psi-5 mRNA. So the, 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 this is like, it, the, the explanation is just because, you know, during uh, the, the, inside, during the, the, the journey in the blood, there is some corona proteins actually that absorb on, on the particles and they make unbiased mass spectrometry proteomics to see and to identify. So for the spleen sort, they found out that indeed, um, indeed you have a very high expressions of the luciferase. And they also find out that uh, uh, here, they find out that the, the, the main component that uh, are actually on the nanoparticle is beta-2 glycoprotein one. Oh, sorry, for the one that is not really uh, modified, it was an apolipoprotein E. 
For the part formulation that is actually targeted to the lung, sorted to the lung, they find out that it's a vitro nectin. Oh, it's T here, vitro nectin, which is actually on, uh, mainly on, on the nanoparticle surfaces. So this is, you can actually modify this by just modifying the length of the peg lipid. So you can see here, C14 peg 2K by C18 peg 2K, you have uh, actually diminutions of the targeting to the liver or the targeting to the lung, okay? So actually it's really, again, it's a, it's a fine uh, sorting. It's, it's, it's quite difficult, in, uh, but, uh, but I think, uh, I mean, Dan Sigurd Lab, I think they, 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 they found out the right lipids to do this. Now I will show you what we've done in my lab, which is clean active targeting using manosylated motif. So for that, we have used a uh, liposomes made with this imidazole-based lipid, but also histidylated polylysine in the same sort of histidylated PI, and we add a three manosylated lipid. So the idea is to target recep manos receptor. And you see here, this is actually the endogenous ligand of the manos receptor. It's quite big, quite difficult to produce. We managed to make actually a motif lipid with free motif. So we add this free motif on the top, on, on, the, on the liposomes. And after IV injection, it goes to the spleen very nicely, as you can see here. To really show that dendritic cells are actually the target, we used a transgenic mass expressing CD11C fused with diphtheria toxin receptor. And by treating the mice with diphtheria toxin, you see there is really, a really eradication of the signal. So the dendritic cells are expressing the luciferase mRNA here. So this is a work that we've done with Kevin Van, uh, with Eternas and the Tillman's lab, where they actually propose to have this trimix technology the mRNA of antigen plus mRNA coding for some molecules that can immunostimulate immunos immunos uh, molecules. I think most of you know it. So once we uh, actually in, uh, deliver uh, our, uh, our, our, uh, our mRNA by IV injection, after three hours, if you look uh, by nanostring technology, the transcriptomes in the blood, we see that we have an upregulation of interleukin-12, is here, marginal increase of pro-inflammatory cytokines, no inductions of uh, uh, interleukin-4, interleukin-17, but of course a very good uh, expressions of interferon gamma and 6 cell 10. The outcome of this is that if you use an E7 mRNA plus a trimix, and to, after the implantations of the tumors, here is TC1, uh, liposomes versus the LPR, only 12 microgram, you can see that the production of CTHT specific T cells is very high for the LPR versus the liposomes. And you also found out that it's working both for unmodified and non-modified mRNA. And here is the tumor volume. So we do have something which is a very low inflammatory state and you don't need actually like nucleoside modification, which is good in terms of cost. But there are different types of applications of this mRNA, and we are really in the beginning of a, diff of a long journey, I think. Immunotherapy, of course, I talk a little bit about it, but also protein replacement of those gene editing. So today, I think you've heard uh, in the press, there are diff type, different types of vaccination application of vaccine, vaccination trials that is ongoing. Uh, this is the, the, the for Moderna, Pfizer, uh, Sanofi, CureVac, and Glacus Viscine. So you see that phase two is actually the Moderna ones for influenza, RSV is in a phase three, CMV for Moderna as well, the Zika, and uh, most of the infection actually is tackled by uh, Moderna. Uh, something which is, I think it's very interesting is the BNV infection, the mononucleosis. I don't know if you know that the prevalence of EBV is higher in people with multiple sclerosis. So actually Moderna started to produce this vaccine 
Then again, you can encapsulate four mRNA in just one nanoparticles. So four RNA antigens for the EPV. So we'll see if it's working. And of course, you have heard also for the HIV vaccine. For here, uh, I really want to show it to you because you can even, you know, encode something which is complex. Here, we know that HIV envelope, which is scaffolded on ferritin, has a very high uh, uh, um, feature to induce neutralized antibody. So the mRNA has been actually designed to encode TB120, TB41 with a linker and the ferritin. And you see very nicely these NSM images of the 2D calcifications of the trimers. So they made the uh, an infection uh, of these uh, mice, very specific strain, and you see two two types, two one two types. One is stabilized, and one is with mutations. And you see that those two, actually those two mRNA, allows in this cell pseudotype strain a very high expressions of the uh, neutralized antibody, okay, specifically. And of course, it is going. Uh, it's it's inducing. Uh, germinal center B cells and also memory B cells. So clearly, these mRNA technologies is very, you can actually manipulate the cells, um, the, uh, manipulate actually the, the, the organisms to induce BNAP and also to induce, this, you know, the mutations that we need for the BNAP. The second example I would like to show is the gene editing. Uh, very, very recent paper for Dan Anderson lab. Here, they are making a high throughput platform to synthesize a screen, a combinatorial library. So here it's a, uh, actually they're, they're, they're uh, ionizable lipid. And uh, as a linker, they use this uh, nitrocinolic acrylate, it's actually it's from palm oil and different types of aliphatic alcohol. And they made exactly what I am doing. And it's an intratracheal uh, delivery. And of course, they deliver Cree mRNA delivery or CRISPR-Cas9. And you see here that you have, they have a very nice expression, dose-dependent in the lung. And by just um, using these uh, transgenic mice, uh, using uh, uh, what you can actually express, the DT tomato, if you have a erase, if you make an editing of this stock, uh, you see here that they can actually increase expression and use the expressions of tomato T cells. And it's not toxic because they can actually deliver it three times very nicely. And they identify that the club cells and also ciliated cells can be edited. And I think the view, again, I'm really fascinated because you can also make a combination of viral vectors here. And I think if you have something which is not toxic, you can do this. And it's very helpful for the AAV. So here, three groups, one just with the lipos LNP, the second one, uh, SP, Cas9 mRNA, and this one is EAV. So you see here, very nicely, you can have an increase, of course, of the uh, tomato expressing cells. And with the AAV, you also see the expressions of the GFP that has been actually expressed through the AAV. So very promising for gene therapy of congenital lung disease. But there are also different types of uh, things that are going on uh, uh, in vivo. Uh, the verb therapeutics for CRISPR adenine based editor of PSK, PSK, uh, PSC canine quite. You see here, uh, just once you reduce highly, actually the expressions of this, uh, the amount of this uh, LDLC, and this one, instead of using ICI RNA, you can use also do the gene editing. This is a intelia therapeutics. Again, you see just one. It's really a dose response. You reduce expression uh, up to one year, which is very, very interesting. So um, I would like to show you what we are doing in my lab for the NK cells. So we make our proper ionizable lipid. And NK cells is difficult because it's very tough to transfect, as you can see here. And we actually managed to have a lipoplexis and LNP to really highly express more than 80% uh, the uh, mRNA GFP here. 
the lipoplexis is higher in uh, compared to the lipoplex. So again, here I'm showing that our ionizable lipid, we don't need to have modified actually nucleoside because the non-modified ion is expressing higher and compared to the two types of modifications, both for the LN lipoplexis and the LNP. And I just want to say that here we are overnight incubation without toxicity. So we propose to use it for the, you know, instead of using recombinant interleukin protein, which is needed for the proliferation, we replace it with mRNA. Again, um, we are showing, I'm showing you here the mortality without the interleukin 2 addition. So of course, without anything, you have an increase as function of time. This is the protein for, uh, uh, after six days, you started to have the mortality, but if the mRNA, you, of course, it's starting, you really have the mortality, 40% only after eight days, both for the lipoplexis, the LNP. And of course, we have the expressions, the interleukin protein, and because we have the processing, because it's expressed metabol inside the cells, we have these two bands. Those lipoplexis and LNP work in also in primary NK cells. Uh, 65%, and it's really interesting. And what is interesting again is that we conserve the activations and the lytic functionalization. You see here different types of marker, the stuff, the protein, the boost, and the mRNA. You can see that you conserved really all of these marker. Uh, uh, just uh, and, and and this is very uh, again uh, we we just we just one. One, one, one transfection. Uh, if you take those transfected cells and put them in front of case 5, 6, 2, 6, 2 cells, they are able to kill them, of course, and uh, in the same manner as the cells that has been actually cultured with interleukin protein, okay, 48 hour and 72 hour. And we have also the expression of CASMAS3, 3, 3, 7, uh, and also the TNF alpha. So we are really very excited for that. So if you would like to spare actually the, the for that, but again, you can tell me, okay, but it's, you know, it's reducing after a while. But if you would like to increase actually the, 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 the time of expression, the mRNA, and also to spare the dose, you can use self-amplifying mRNA. Here you have your design where you include replicates, which is able to actually amplify the CDS of the mRNA of interest. So the example here is a vaccination of uh, influenza. So instead of using 180, 20 microgram to get this uh, high titer of uh, uh, antibody, you see, you reduce it to 10 fold, 100 fold less. So very interesting. And uh, Tron's lab and BioNTech proposed, because here, I'm sorry to say, it is a one, 15 kb, very long, very difficult to produce, difficult to do, to, to transfect. So Tron and BioNTech proposed to do this transamplifying mRNA, air uh, replicon, where the two, you, two different molecules to encode the replicates and the antigens. And again, you see here, you have a very good uh, reductions of the dose, 50 nanograms of the trans transreplicons is exactly the same of 1.25 microgram of this cephalopipine mRNA and 20 microgram of the mRNA. So the field is really having a very nice data, uh, but difficult. So we actually doing to, to difficult because to, to make these delivery systems. So what we have to do is to make use of quality by design approach. Here, you actually make a design of experiment. You make a few formulation with different types of uh, a component. And then you look at what you have in terms of expressions, in terms of biodistributions. And then you use statistical modeling to see exactly how is the response with these different types of formulation. And once you do this, the model will predict you the best one. And then you can actually make a validations. So see the immune response here, this is actually done by Eterna. And it's a very, the, the, the model that they have found here really has been validated by the experimental uh, uh, 
ex uh, experimental actually um, methods. So the sur response surface plot allows you really to find out what types, what percentage you have to use in the predicted optimal and non-optimal actually formulation. You see here, uh, CD8, positive T cell for this E7 antigen, uh, uh, and the optimal one when you are using it, you get a 65-7% of the extramer comp compared to the non-optimal one, which is 8.22. Today, you really need to, you can actually think about, one, you need to assess the patient need. We are going, you can identify the critical quality attributes. From our knowledge, you can actually define process parameter, critical process parameter. And then you made our model, and then you make a process design, and then you implement it. And then actually you really can have a very good uh, uh, manufacturing framework, integrating all of this process and actually reducing the, the loss of time. So what I'm going to do with the if, the, if, the, if my collaborators at the, at the, at the, at the BAH, we are actually going to tackle the project uh, founded this adoptive T cell therapy. So you know that the problem we have when you have toddy tumors, um, there, it, there is a migrations of the T cells inside the tumor, but you have this uh, dis dysregulated vasculatures, you have a physical barrier, you have a suppressed T cells. And you have this immune inhibition by the tumor cells and also some insoluble uh, inhibitors. And of course, you know the problems of the tumor uh, 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 microbe environment. So we need, if you would like to use CAR T cells, you really need to figure out how can we do the manufacturing? How can you reduce the cost? How can you actually use it uh, in a very good way? And you can also you have to also find out how can we actually detect the tumor? you know, target the antigens in the tumor. So the, the CARNA project is really, instead of, you, you would like to use genetic modification uh, by using cost-effective advanced RNA technology to develop multitasking CAR T cells. So the, by modifying, replacing the curate attempt here by RNA technology, ex vivo and in vivo using RNA modified multitasking CAR T cells, which is going to have to be efficient and safe. And then you will have CAR T stimulating CI ligand. So really trying to improve the problem we have here, the cost and the efficacy. But this collaboration uh, from, with uh, Michael uh, and uh, Dieter Vogt allows me really to, op uh, to the, the open different collaboration with different groups like uh, uh, Amini Lab for the improvement and translations of adoptive T cell therapy, the Wagner Lab for the gene editing method for primary immune cells, Polanski Lab for the mRNA, improving the mRNA based epigenetic editing approach, Gossen Lab for designing nanoparticles to actually transfect primary human monocyte and derived macrophages, and of course this collaboration, collaboration between Volk and Gossen Labs for orchestrations of a biological process of human response in the case of regeneration. So here, the mRNA technology accelerator that I actually am building in Orléans, associated with my innovative therapy, we can really, I hope, by using the quality by design, fine tuning the mRNA formulation, I hope that we can find a very good thing. So to conclude, we really here, we have an opportunities. Uh, today, but there are also some challenges. We know exactly the mRNA format, what we have to do, to do actually, to, uh, you know, e for human. We have this rapidity and flexibility, versatility, combinations of multiple mRNA. But of course, the challenge is we still need way to produce something which is a high, low cost. We still need way to produce something which is a, so, um, also with but maybe better, so new, modifi new modifications, uh, new, new strategy uh, in terms of stability, improving the durations of the expression. I told you about self-amplifying mRNA, but there is a circular mRNA, which is also uh, ongoing. As I said, the, 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 the bottleneck is actually the delivery systems. We need to find out the best targeting strategy, impact on the intracellular routing, 
uh, because sometimes we have a redu reductions of a translation. But for that, we require the models to accelerate clinical translation and prediction of activity and the tropism of different formulation. But also we need to make a standard, you know, with quality control standard to help ensure the safety and efficacy of this therapy. And the last, define a clear regulatory recommendation to help developer, developers to work for the, in their strategy. And I'm really glad that because we actually have this, we just applied for this ERD2 IHI European project, rare disease, lead by INSERM, where in which BAH did a la charity with um, Dieter Volk, Michael Smuke henares uh, and also uh, Norman Dritzman Gossenslaw uh, are involved. Um, there are things, many things are going on. I just want to show you here, just to, it's a slide just to show you that you have, a, it's really in the rise, you know, it's a growing space, a strong promise. There is a current bolus of investment of mRNA therapeutics, as you can see here. And I hope that we will see something which is very good is coming uh, in the new, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very few years. So for that, I would like to thank the, my innovative therapies, uh, nanomedicines uh, lab, oh, sorry, this S here, a uh, lot of my collaborations, a lot of my fundings, because, you know, we cannot do anything without funding. Again, I would like to thank Stiftung Charity and also all of my collaborators at Berlin, which is, I really appreciate. They are so uh, amazing young collaborators and also key opinion leader, Dieter Folde, Preter Renke, and uh, so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. And now I am open for your questions. And uh, sorry, I was a bit long, maybe. Sorry. Thank you very much, Chantal, for this great overview of the field and the, the, the more specific projects you're involved in. I think crosstalk of basic biology and chemistry and the direct application is really wonderful. Um, I already see a question uh, in the chat. So everyone, please type your questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so we have a question to the first part from Steffen Fuchs, uh, I will read it. You talked about the RNA modification effect the distribution of the particles in the body. How about RNAi or ASO technologies? So I get antisense, uh, yeah. oligonucleotides. Okay. What modifications are important here for the yeah. distribution? What modifications are important yeah. here for the distribution? So so actually, um, the, 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 the effect that we have seen uh, on the impact of mRNA modification is uh, uh, the fact that uh, we, we have uh, a long mRNA, okay? Which when you, the modification that they are made in, they are actually modifying all of uretine or all of metacytos or cytosine in the mRNA, which in the end impact the structure of the mRNA. And the, 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 the interactions with, with the mRNA, with the lipid uh, components. But for the small one, uh, there is, I don't think that the, there, there is actually an impact of those modifications, like methylphosphonate, or it's, it's only on the stability of those small molecules. Huh? Thank you. I hope, I hope uh, Stefan is happy. Um, we have a question. We have a thank you uh, from the people uh, for the great overview. Uh, we have a question from Maria Hastermann. Is the central nervous system targeted by any of the particles, LNPs? And if not, why not? Yeah. So today, uh, today the, 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 there is no um, solid, I would say like that. There is no solid lipid nanoparticles formulation that have been actually proposed for the for the brain uh, it's just because uh, of the it's very difficult in terms of uh, targeting um, people actually trying to make formulation um, uh, you know using a, a specific um, a for uh, like transferring or uh, peptide but but in the end uh, 
there is no clear uh, benefit effect, I would say like that, uh, in terms of delivery. I think what we have to do now, and this is something that we are really doing in my lab and enough at the time to, to, tell, to talk to you, to tell you, is to combine physical methods and lipid nanoparticles. And here in my lab, one of my young, uh, young colleagues, Anthony Delalande, he, he is actually building ultrasound and micro bubbles based methods that you can actually, you know, focus on the specific part of the brain. And we started to know that if you combine the micro bubbles plus the lipid nanoparticle or just the lipid nanoparticle and the micro bubbles, the ultrasound wave will actually destabilize the, 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 um, the blood vessels. And we have a very good expression of the nucleic acid plus the DNA, mRNA, or silence. So for me, this is the most promising in terms of strategy. Okay, thanks. I think that was a clear answer to Maria. Uh, I have a question. I don't see a question for now in the chat. Uh, to please type in your questions uh, regarding the, the NK, your own NK experiments. Um, so what I missed was do the NK cells proliferate? And how does this associate to the to the to the efficacy and the protein expression? Okay, so yes, or um, we we know we the, the idea was could we actually instead of because we have this NK ninety two it was an NK ninety two I don't know if I said NK two if that is I'm so sorry it's NK ninety two cells they are actually dependent on interleukin two. Okay, so usually instead of, you know, using protein, the idea is just, could you just transfect them for once with uh, interleukin 2 mRNA? And yes, we have a proliferation. Okay, and yes, we, we, we know that the, the, the amount of the proteins that we are producing is actually, at, it's, it's actually exactly more or less the same as the, the interleukin to protein that we are given. I don't know if I, I, I answered your question, Masha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, no? and, and, and does, does each proliferation really uh, dilute uh, the protein expression of the. Uh, the of protein course, protein? yes. Uh, this is our, yeah, of course, it's, yes, of course, it's diluting the, yes, the, in, in, as, as, as the proliferation is going. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. So here in the experiment, I showed it just once, but I think we need to do it, you know, maybe every four days. Actually, we, we, we to show that there is no uh, if, uh, uh, toxicity, we were able to make a, a subsequent transfection mm. and, you know, we maintain the proliferation. Mm. Okay. I see another question from Vera Mantos. I have a question concerning the manufacturing of mRNA LMPs with more than one mRNA sequence. You showed several examples of them, but how can you control the ratio of these mRNAs in the final mRNA LMP so that you have at the end the desired NL LMP with, for example, three different mRNA sequences? Oh, this is a very good question. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, the, 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 when, you, when you make this, uh, this formulation, um, we... we we have to make sure that the 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 type of um, first of all the amount of mRNA that are entrapped inside the lipid nanoparticles you, you, you can you 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 can identify it and at the same time we can also actually really um, uh, quantify uh, inside the, the the formulation the amount of the of the of the the type of uh, of mRNA which is inside, I just want to I, again I don't we actually we we managed to make a flow cytometry analysis that allows us uh, with three types of um, mRNA allows us to see if we have a co-localization uh, of the three types of mRNA uh, uh, inside one spot which is actually related to uh, one LMP. Agree with you, it's not telling me exactly the amount in uh, exact quantification, but at least 
in some of the, the formulation that we made, we can really see that uh, some of them are higher, uh, the, some, 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 some LNP have much more two mRNA versus the other one, because I think in terms of encapsulation, we did, the, the, the microfluidic uh, was not uh, optimized. Good, thank you. Um, Maria has another question. Um, and she says, thank you first. Other question for self-replicating circular mRNA. For how long is the expression maintained and how would you rate the risk for patients of overexpression? Thank you. Yeah, great, yeah, great, great question. So the self-replicating mRNA, uh, it's, of course, it's depending on the type of the self-replicating. But actually in my lab, I have used the VEV. It's the one from... Um, uh, Venezuelan uh, encephalo uh, uh, virus. Um, you can actually extend it for at least two weeks. Okay, so from four or five, you can extend it 10, 10, uh, 10, 10, 15 days. But you are right. We have uh, something which is very long. We have replicates. So um, the safety could be a concern. But what we uh, people are trying, uh, this is also something that I've proposed, is to exactly you know, mimic what viruses are doing, what they are doing. They are expressing this NS1, you know, this protein that can actually reduce the toxicity reduce the immuno, immuno, immunotoxicity of the virus during the infection. Um, one of the big issue with the self-amplifying mRNA is that they are very highly inflammatory because they are long. They are very structured. What we have seen is that if you modify the, the nucleoside, you disrupt actually the efficacy in terms of translation. So that's why uh, I really propose to do this strategy by bioproducing it in yeast, because in yeast it allows us to actually have a modification. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. The circular is exactly the same, a very long, long expression. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Chantal. Uh, I think there are no further questions that I can see. and. Uh, for well, this really wonderful presentation and great overview from all of us and uh, talk to you soon and uh, everyone have a great weekend thank you so much I thank you so I, much i think so i have much. to say bye now yes bye 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 <laughs> say bye bye <sighs>